You shouldn't be proud of not knowing math. You shouldn't be ashamed either, but golly, people always say, oh, me? I hate math. I suck at math. Circles? Yucky. Now, don't get me wrong, I get it. A lot of us had some not great experiences with math in school, and these sorts of phrases often serve as a preemptive defense mechanism against potential embarrassment that came way too often in the school days. But it does seem that math is spoken of in this way uniquely often. People boldly and openly proclaim it as a weakness, and would you speak this way of literature or laws of science? Little old me? Nah, I hate books. I suck at reading books. I mean, I can barely read, period. Books are boring and dumb, and don't even bring up gravity. I don't know a thing about it. Maybe you would speak that way. I'm just saying, mathematics is just as worth studying for its own merit as great works of literature, art, and achievements in science. Because imagine this, a woman comes up to you on the street and presents you a square and challenges you to find the square's diagonal. But you, being an educated man, with swagger and confidence, draw a line that connects opposite corners of the square. Now I know you guys like to give me a hard time about this, so I'll go ahead and use centimeters here just for you. And there you go, mission accomplished, diagonal of the square, found. But imagine this. What if the woman doesn't ask you to find the diagonal of a square, but rather the diameter of a circle? I mean, it's basically the same thing, right? The diagonal of a square is the longest segment contained in the square, and the diameter of a circle is similarly the longest segment contained in the circle. The diagonal of a square passes through its center, and from its length, we can figure out all the important information about the square. And the same can be said about the diameter of a circle. And really, a circle is an even simpler shape than a square. It's just all the points equidistant from a center. So then surely, we as educated adults should have no problem finding the center and diameter of something as elementary as a circle. But you can't just eyeball it. You can't say, well, this looks to be the diameter of the circle. Looks like that passes through the center. That's not what you did with the square. With the square, we're able to connect the opposite corners and guarantee that gets us the diagonal. There's no eyeballing here, and we shouldn't be eyeballing to draw the diameter of a circle either. If you'd be unable to figure it out, well, this is Emmy Noether, a legendary mathematician from the 20th century, so she could probably help. But how do we do this? It's easy, you just need the tools of the trade, and when it comes to talking to women, the tools are the straight edge and the compass. It's the ancient Greeks who developed straight edge and compass constructions as a way to woo the ladies with gorgeous diagrams. After all, nothing makes a man look sexier than being able to construct a regular hexagon. And like the construction of a regular hexagon, with these ancient tools, finding the center and diameter of a circle is an easy task. So allow me to tell you how we do this and why it works. You may recall this classic simple theory theorem from geometry, that if a line is tangent to a circle, then the radius of the circle that touches that point of tangency is actually perpendicular to the tangent line. But then imagine we slide that tangent line further so that it's actually coming into the circle. If we've just moved this tangent line into the circle, then the part of the line that lies inside the circle is what's called a chord of the circle. And of course, since this is that same tangent line just moved elsewhere, the radius is still perpendicular to this line and the chord. As a result, we also know that this radius radius, in fact, bisects the chord. It cuts it in half. This is because, consider these two triangles, the triangle created by these two radii. These two triangles are certainly congruent because they're right triangles that share this leg and their hypotenuses are both radii of the same circle. So by the hypotenuse leg congruence postulate, these two triangles 
are congruent, so again, this chord has actually been bisected by the radius. In this sketch, we're thinking about how the radius of a circle interacts with a chord of the circle. But to find the center, radius, and diameter of a circle, we can use this same argument backwards. Because not only is it the case that a radius like this will bisect a chord at a right angle, but in fact, if we have a chord and we construct a segment that bisects it at a right angle, that segment for sure will contain the center and thus, if continued, would be the diameter of the circle. So if we're given an arbitrary circle, well, no, we can't just pick out the center at a glance, but it is very easy to construct a chord of the circle. Of course, by definition, a chord is just a segment lying inside the circle with its endpoints on the circumference. And notice how we use the straight edge there. Now again, I know that if there was a tangent to the circle over here, the radius would intersect it perpendicularly. So I'm imagining that this chord is like that tangent line brought inside of the circle. And now if we can construct a segment which bisects this chord, at a right angle, that segment will pass through the center. We could then extend the segment to get a diameter of the circle, and then repeat that process to get another diameter, which necessarily would intersect the first one at the center of the circle. Okay, so how do we actually proceed with this construction? Well, at this juncture is when we need the compass. We simply place the fixed point of the compass on one endpoint of our cord, and then extend the compass so that it is at least half of this cord length. Right now, my compass is long enough. You could extend it to the whole cord length if you wanted, but as long as you're past the halfway mark, you're good, and then you're going to trace out an arc. All we really need is an arc below the cord and an arc above the cord. Then repeat the same exact process, not changing the width of the compass, on the other endpoint of the cord. We do an upper arc, which intersects that arc we previously drew, and we do a lower arc, which also intersects the arc we previously drew. It is then the intersections of these arcs that we can use to construct our segment that cuts the cord perpendicularly and in half. So we'll join those endpoints, and this is of course what we call in the trade a perpendicular bisector of the cord. Now, how do we know that this is doing what we want it to? How do we know that if we construct a segment like this, it's going to cut this cord in half at a right angle? It certainly looks like it does, but how do we know for sure? Well, let's justify that. And to do so, I'm going to draw a couple of triangles. So there's a radius from the center to that endpoint. Here's another radius from the center to the other endpoint. Then also, I'm going to take this intersection of those arcs and connect connect that to the endpoints of my chord as well. Firstly, we know that this triangle on the left is congruent to this triangle on the right. We know that because of side, side, side. They share this side, and then these two sides are congruent because they are radii of the same circle. Finally, these two sides are congruent because they are radii of circles with the same radius. These segments came from using the compass. This part here is a radius of that circle of which we took only an arc, and we didn't change the compass length to construct this other arc. So the radii are the same, that's what these are. The fact that this triangle is congruent to this one means that these two angles must be congruent as well. That then means that this little triangle on the left is congruent to this little triangle on the right. That's because we know that these two sides are congruent, because again, they are basically just radii of circles with the same radius. They share this common side, and then we just show that the angles included between those sides are congruent. So by side angle side, these two triangles are congruent, and that's the key. That of course means that these supplementary angles are congruent, hence they have to be right angles, and these two segments are congruent. Hence Hence, the chord of the circle has been bisected. Since this segment is a perpendicular bisector of a chord of this circle, we know that if we extend this segment, it will contain the center and a diameter and radius of the circle. Now, at a glance, you might be thinking this point here is the center of the circle. Remember that it is not. That's just the intersection of these arcs, which came from a somewhat arbitrary width of the compass we selected. Remember, its width just had to be more more than half of the cord. So it could have been longer, it could have been a bit shorter, it just had to be more than half of this cord. So for sure now, we have a diameter. This segment 
passes through the center of the circle. But to actually find the center, all we need to do is repeat this construction, because a second diameter of the circle is going to intersect this one at the circle's center. So then I will, with swagger and confidence, repeat this process elsewhere. Doesn't matter, just pick another two points of the circle and construct a chord. So it's funny thinking about school. Every day after school, when I was in, I think, first grade, my brother would take me to the library and I'd pick out a book. And one day I picked out this, this children's story called Hop Toad. And at some point I read the book to the class and everybody loved that book about that toad. Who could blame him? So now uh, if we connect these two points of intersection of the arcs, guaranteed I'm gonna get a line that contains a diameter of the circle. And then at last, where it intersects the previous diameter must be the circle's center. Straight edge and compass constructions are pretty fun, and it's a classic art of mathematics. That's how you could use these simple tools to find the center of any circle. And hey, if you really want to feel like you're one with the Greeks, these are my underpants. On these underpants, you can see the legendary Euclid of Alexandria, as well as several other mathematical pigeons. They're in a bunch of pigeonholes here. You can get the pigeonhole principle boxer briefs and a bunch of other cool math inspired products at mathshin.com. Check it out, link in the description. These pigeonhole principle undies are pretty cool, but if you go out in the streets doing straight edge and compass constructions, you probably won't be wearing them very long. I'm on the I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and unsort the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm straight and hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you so, so.